So today, we're going to do a bit of a review. I said we were probably wrapping up chapter 3, but I lied again. We're going to introduce chapter 4 by reviewing chapter 3. How's that? We've seen in the letter to the Philippians that this is so much more than just a joy-filled letter of thanks to Paul's beloved assembly of Christ followers in the region of Macedonia. This letter is a heartfelt call from Paul to these believers to remain faithful. He's urging them to pursue the same faith that they have already been pursuing. This isn't something new to them. Paul sees in them the pursuit of their faith, and he's asking them to continue pursuing that. These believers have been called to a life of humility, of self-denial, and sacrificial service as they expectantly await the return of Jesus for a completion of the plan of redemption, which will give them new resurrection bodies that will reflect the glory of God forever. We've seen Paul emphasize to these believers that their lifestyle is to be committed to knowing Jesus and to knowing the power that's in his resurrection. How often we lose sight of that. There is power in the resurrection of Jesus. And that same power is offered to us to deal with our daily lives and situations. Mentoring and being mentored by godly examples is one of the ways that we do that. One of the ways that we focus on the power and become more like Christ. We commit ourselves to share in the details and the suffering of Christ and be conformed to his death. We're supposed to have the same mindset of Christ. We saw that back in chapter 2. Christ submitted himself humbly. He became obedient to the will of the Father. And this is the same thing that we are told to do, even as Christ did to the point of death. They're not to think too highly of themselves. They are to work together. They are to strive together. They're to think the same things. This is unity in our worship, unity in our purpose, unity in our work and our striving. None of us are alone. None of us are called to walk alone. This life that they are being called to is in sharp contrast to the enemies of the cross who place their own desires as their gods. They glory in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. This is what Paul has been describing at the end of chapter 3. The examples that we look to are just as important today as they were in the first century when Paul wrote this letter to these believers. Our mentors, our coaches, discipleship partners, whatever you want to call this relationship, it's a critical part of our daily walk and our growth. It's important to show people how they are to act, not just to tell them. Someone said, values are easier caught than taught. We pursue values like self-denial and self-sacrifice and humility when we see them displayed in others, when we see them in action from other people. Paul has given incredible motivation to these believers by pointing out their true citizenship in God's kingdom. We are a living representative of the kingdom of God here and now. We aren't just passively waiting to get to our heavenly abode. We are living now with the conviction that heaven is our home and we're just passing through this place. We're living in humble service right now in preparation for our eternal existence and service to God for his glory. Now we may ask ourselves, why do we need to follow in the footsteps of others? Isn't it just enough for us to point to Jesus and say, be like Jesus? Right? Anybody remember that WWJD? What would Jesus do? 
Just be like Jesus. He's perfect. Pointing out such a perfect example and telling people just be like Jesus, be perfect, makes it seem impossible. At least it does to me. It'd be easier to point to the peak of Mount Everest and say, get there. No matter how much I may want to be on top of that mountain, I cannot make it on my own. My efforts at perfection don't even come close to the perfection found in Jesus. His divine nature, his sinless life, his powerful works, his totally unwavering obedience make me feel inept and discouraged and it brings me to the verge of giving up. That's a horrible thing for me to say from the pulpit, isn't it? Anybody else felt like that? This is too much. I'm just going to give up. I can't do this. When I see an imperfect person who's like me, who's fragile, who's flawed, who's faithful, continue to pursue Christ-likeness, even in their frailty, it helps me understand it is achievable. I can do it because I've seen them do it. I know that they fail. I know that they're flawed, but they're faithful in their walk. And that gives me the encouragement to continue. This is where the flawed human being and the grace of God interconnect. When those two things come together, I understand that it isn't the power of the person that are pursuing godliness. It's by the working of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's when God gets the glory. When we see God interact with me in my flawedness, he is lifted up, not me. God, Paul, or God told Paul that very same thing. My strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Paul has given us tangible examples of flawed people who are living exemplary lives. He did that for Timothy and for Epaphroditus. The Philippians can see these people, tangible evidence of these people practicing the values of humility and self-sacrifice and sacrificial living as they align their lives with the kingdom of heaven. Paul was very careful in who he picked as examples for these beloved believers and we must be discerning in our choice of role models as well. We have to understand, first of all, that the people we follow will not be perfect yet. They will fail. They will sin. There will be no mentor without sin or without weakness here on this earth. But the best mentors learn from their mistakes and they encourage others to avoid them. The mentors we should be looking to point us constantly to focus on God's kingdom and not on their own convictions or opinions or accomplishments. So then how do we practice this following in the footsteps of someone whose life is focused on God's kingdom and the pursuit of Christ-likeness? How do we know that we're following the right people? Paul knows that the people we follow will shape who we become. He's presented examples and enemies and expectations so that we're able to contrast those who pursue Christ with eager expectation of heaven with those who are the enemies of the cross. So before we look at this next section, I want to give four examples, four things to look for in the lives of those that we choose to follow. But first, let's pray together. Again, from the Puritan prayer book. Eternal God, the heavens declare your glory, the earth your riches display. The universe is your temple and your presence fills immensity, yet you take pleasure in created life and communicated happiness. 
You have made me what I am and given me what I have. In you I live and move and have my being. Your providence has set the bounds of my life and you wisely administer all the details. I thank you for your riches to me in Jesus, for the unclouded revelation of him in your word, where I behold his person and character, his grace and glory, humiliation, sufferings, death, and resurrection. Allow me to feel a need of his continual saviorhood and cry with Job, I am vile, and with Peter, I perish, and with the publican, be merciful to me, a sinner. Subdue in me the love of sin. Let me know the need of renewal as well as of forgiveness in order to serve and enjoy you forever. I come to you in the all-prevailing name of Jesus with nothing of my own I bring. No works, no worthiness, no promises. I'm often straying, often knowingly opposing your authority, often abusing your goodness. Much of my guilt arises from my religious privileges, my low estimation of them, my failure to use them to my advantage. But I am not careless of your favor or thoughtless of your glory. Impress me deeply with a sense of your omnipotence that you are sovereign in my ways, in my lying down, and my end. Amen. Last week, we briefly began the discussion of discipleship. So before we close out this section, I want to look again at the tests that Paul has given us as we seek out those discipleship relationships. This test is focused more on those that we look to as our mentors, but we can also ask of ourselves these same questions as we examine our worthiness to mentor others. Because that's what we should be looking for. Not just someone to disciple us, but someone that we can turn and disciple as well. Looking again at chapter 3 and verse 19, we see some questions that we can ask ourselves. Let's read that again together. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their stomach, and glory is in their shame, who set their thoughts on earthly things. So the first question that we want to ask ourselves, the first thing I see in that verse is what is the logical end for the people that we follow? Paul says that for the enemies of the cross, their end is destruction. That's the logical end of those who are enemies of the cross. It's a negative example, but we can turn and look at the positive side as that as well. Those who align their lives with God's kingdom will show a pattern of growth and maturity over their lives. They will have a deepening intimacy with Jesus and gain a deeper spiritual knowledge from God's word and from the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read from verse 1 all the way down through verse 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied." Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those whose lives are aligned 
with the kingdom define their lives according to the Sermon on the Mount and not the pursuit of the American dream. This is a true blessed life. Do you want to have a blessed life and blessings for eternity? Look at the examples that Jesus preached about. Understand that we're all flawed. We will all fail. We look not at the momentary, but at the whole life. Satan wants to drag us into shame and into guilt. The promise of God's word is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Paul told the Philippians that he does one thing. What is that? I forget what lies behind and I press forward towards that goal of Christ-likeness. We should see in our mentors a character trait of striving to be more like Christ. There will be bumps, there will be flaws, there will be failures along that path, but we will constantly see that striving when we look at the whole. The logical end of their life pursuit will be eternity of glorifying their Savior and God because that's how they live this mortal life life. The enemies of the cross are stuck in a pattern of self-indulgence and self-glory and the denial of God. This leads to despair and inwardness and guilt and separation from God. This life right here and right now is the best that they will ever have because hell is their eternal future. Do you understand that? When they say, live your best life right now, they're telling the truth. This is as good as it's going to get. The second thing that we have to ask about our mentors is what is the appetite of the people that we follow? Those who align their lives with the kingdom of God will hunger and thirst for righteousness, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6. They will see that obedience to God is the source of their food. That's what Jesus said in John 4, 34. The enemies of the cross will serve their appetites of self-indulgence. These people will binge on TV and social media to find the latest trends and social constructs that they should be following. They'll gorge themselves on material goods that never satisfy They will consume relationships like a commodity because there's no better feeling than new. They will treat people as resources to be used for what they can get and then discarded. Those that we choose to be our mentors are sensitive to the needs of others. Like Paul mentions in chapter 2 and verse 3 of Philippians. They don't think highly of themselves, but they are aware that their lives are being mimicked, so they pay close attention to their own walk. They offer themselves humbly as examples to be followed. These are the people who Paul tells the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, he said, but we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord And admonish you. The mentors that Paul is talking about first are laboring, not lording it over others. And second, they're among the people, again, not placing themselves above anyone else. These people desire to see others have a meaningful and growing relationship with the Savior. The third thing that we need to ask about our mentors is where do they find their worth? If those people who you have set as role models in your life are seeking first the glory of God or are they seeking the glory that comes from their physical prowess or their appearance or their superior intellect or their financial success, or even in their social standing, then you're following people who are pursuing what will not endure. These things are fleeting pursuits, and you are being led down a pathway of shame. 
Paul says that these people glory in their shame. Remember what Proverbs 14, 12 says. Anybody remember that one? It's on the board also. There is a way which seems right to who? To a man. But its end is the way of what? Death. There's another promise just two chapters back. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28. It says, in the path of what? Righteousness is life. In this pathway, there is no death. The way of a man seems right to him, but its pathway leads to death. The way of righteousness has no death. It leads to life. Do you see the contrast? Choose your mentors and your leaders who find their worth in faithfulness and hopefulness and humility. Finally, we need to ask about our mentors and our role models, what consumes their minds. Paul makes it clear that the minds of the enemies of the cross are fixed on earthly things. They're consumed with material matters above spiritual things. There may be some spiritual interests, but those are easily overshadowed by gas prices or weather forecasts or sports tabloid gossip or the current situation of the government. Countless other matters that are so superficial and trivial in nature that take up so much of our time. Now it doesn't mean that there can't be any talk about those things. The price of gas, the rising prices at the store affect all of us. It's something that will be something we discuss I'm not saying that mentors and leaders need to live in a bubble or pretend that there is no interest in those things. The bottom line is that the mind who's fixed on Christ will be at peace regardless of what else is going on around us. The price of gas is going to be a secondary concern when we, may, when we focus on Christ. There will be discussion about earthly things because this is where we live, but the mind that's worth emulating will meditate on what matters. And what matters are those things that are pleasing to God, those things that bring glory to God. Paul is going to describe this a little further in chapter 4. We're going to skip ahead and look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. This is what the mind who's fixed on Christ, looks like. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, consider these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So when your mentors and your leaders spend time meditating on the truth of God's word, there will be a peace about them because the temporary and passing things of this world will not hold sway over their thoughts. We all have a tendency to follow or to copycat others. The world knows this very well. Look at any kind of marketing campaign and you'll see that this is true. Do what this person does. Drive what this famous person drives. Eat what this athlete eats. Use what this entertainer uses. God knows our tendency to follow what others are doing and saying. And he's given us good and positive role models and mentors and leaders because of that. Be careful about who you are following. Make it a conscious act And don't blindly walk along without having someone to guide you. Paul says, mimic me as I mimic Christ. He also points out two visible role models, Timothy and Epaphroditus, as examples for them to follow. He urges believers to follow those who are leading according to the example that he has given, their eyes fixed on heaven and their Savior. This brings us to the next verse, which is part of this thought process, but it's in the next chapter. 
There are times when the chapter breaks don't necessarily follow the thought process of the person who wrote the original letter. And it appears that Paul has broken his train of thought from verse 21 of chapter 3 to chapter 4, verse 1. But I believe this is actually a continuation and a conclusion that he's making before he moves on to other matters which are brought up in verse 2 of chapter 4. So in Philippians, we see from all the things that he's discussed in this last section about following a good example to being aware of the bad examples to focusing attention on heaven from where our Savior resides and will return to take us to him, Paul now gives an application in verse 1. Some commentaries move past this verse quickly to the issue that Paul is addressing in verse 2. It's much easier and juicier to look at the gossip, right? Others kind of leave this verse hanging where it is because it's the mushy-gushy part of a love letter. It seems like it's very personal and private with all of this love language, so we're just going to leave it there kind of between the sender and the recipient. But I see an application And I see encouragement. So I want to spend the rest of our time today looking at what's being said there. The application is this. When we follow the right leaders, we will stand firm, even in the midst of opposition and persecution. So let's read this verse together. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Oh, I have to get back there. Therefore, my brothers, loved and longed for my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Do you see why people think that's kind of the mushy-gushy part between Paul and his beloved Philippians? Loved and longed for my joy and my crown. Such amazing, loving language coming from him. But when you get right down to the action in this verse, the verb in this verse, we see Paul is giving another directive. Stand firm, he said. We also see an adverb that describes the verb. The Greek word autos is translated in this way in this version. Other versions have it as thus or so. And without getting too deep into the relationship of verb and adverb, we understand that this is describing the manner or the means in which they are to stand firm. In this way, they are to stand firm. What we see from the context is Paul is probably pointing backwards to what he's just said rather than forward to the disputing sisters in verse 2. However, some do see this pointing forward beyond the dispute, and to the exhortations that are given in verses 4 and 5 and 6 and 8 and 9. Paul has given several more exhortations as he's closing out this letter. Still others believe that Paul is using this statement as a bridge, and he's pointing both directions. We have a good and bad example given to us in verses 17 through 21. We have an exhortation behind us to fix our eyes on Christ. He's going to show an example of two people in verse 2 who are focused on themselves and then give more exhortation to live according to the ways that honor God and show our focus is on heaven. That's a bridge pointing backwards and forwards. Today... We're not going to enter that argument. I'm going to, I see how all three of those things work together and how they can all apply to our text, but today we're only going to look at the text and we'll argue semantics another time. The exhortation that's in front of us in this verse is to stand firm in this way. Whether that points backwards or forwards, we have to understand this in itself is extremely important. If we don't follow godly examples and have mentors and leaders that guide us in the way of righteousness, we won't stand firm. If we follow our desires and passions which change rapidly, we won't stand firm. 
if we focus on our rights and our privileges, which is what the examples in verse 2 are doing, we won't stand firm. I think we can all agree that the church, the way of thinking and the devotion that we have to God's Word is under attack. It isn't new. This isn't something new to us. It's not even unexpected. Jesus warned his followers in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. And Paul says the exact same thing. He echoes what Jesus said in Acts. He said, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. John MacArthur in his commentary points out there are three sources of the assault on the body of Christ. First is the world. Since the Garden of Eden, there have been enticements and lures that are trying to do their best to get the attention of believers and draw our focus away from the pursuit of Christlikeness. If the temptations fail to draw our attention away and get us to join them, then we're persecuted for not giving in and being drawn away. There's often persecution and attacks and the subtle ways of attacking us sometimes are not so obvious. The unity of the church is constantly under attack. Our message and our work can quickly be discounted when we don't have unity. Do you see why that Paul has said this is so important? And he started in verse or chapter 2 talking about being of the same mind. When the world sees us grumbling and quarreling with each other and our unity under attack, they say that message, whatever they're preaching, doesn't really matter because they don't believe it. Our message is under attack for its validity. It's under attack for its authority. It's called old-fashioned. It's called out of date. It doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't hold the same power with this enlightened generation, is what we're told. The direct attacks on the church have always led to growth. It's always led to a spreading of the gospel into further regions. The indirect attacks, the subtle attacks, cause us to doubt ourselves. Doubt causes us to stop sharing the gospel. If I doubt that this is true, or if I am not unified with what the church believes, I'm not going to share it anymore. The church becomes then a gathering place rather than a power source. This is another reason for us to be in discipleship. We share our doubts and our fears and we encourage one another. We build each other up. We come together here and now to worship God together and to be unified in our purpose so that when we're out there, we're bold in our gospel sharing. Exactly the thing that the author of Hebrews addresses, chapter 10, verse 25. It says, Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see what? The day drawing near. Do we see the day drawing near? Then how much more important is it to come together and encourage each other? The second source of our attacks is our own flesh. The sin nature is always going to try to get us to look to our own desires. Remember what Jesus told the disciples when he found them sleeping instead of praying in the garden. Matthew 26, 41, it says, Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. Why? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is why Paul has spent so much time warning the Philippians to fix their gaze on heaven. Think about what awaits us. Think about the glory that God is receiving right now. Remember where you belong, citizens 
of heaven. Continue to pursue the things that you have seen me pursue, Paul says. Don't give the flesh any opportunity to drag you off course. Paul is aware of the dangers of the sin nature. Himself cries out, Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? Then he goes immediately into the answer and the promise that we all hold in verse 25. Thanks be to God. That's who rescues me from this body of death. Even as a wretched man that I am, I look to God only for rescue. I myself, on one hand, am serving my mind and serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of God of sin. That's the problem with this generation. They have arguments that are based on I think and I feel. Those are from the heart, and the heart is deceitful in its wickedness and the pursuit of its own desires. The third source of our attacks is actually the energy for both the world and the flesh, and it's Satan. He does not want the gospel proclaimed. He wants us to fail in our flesh and to give up. He wants us to believe the lies of the world and just sit here waiting without proclaiming. Satan is very subtle, but he's also very aggressive. Peter tells the church that he prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Paul's warned the Philippians over and over, but this doesn't mean that they have issues of instability. This is probably one of the most stable churches that he's written to. They have been a support and a friend to Paul and to his ministry from the early days, even when no other church is supporting him. They have never been rebuked for any doctrinal errors. It appears that this church has stood firm. Even in the face of persecution, they've been a supporter and a proclaimer of the gospel message. So why does Paul continue to warn them? Because he knows that continued attacks will wear down our resolve. He also sees the beginning of a destabilizing threat in the church taking the form of two people having a disagreement. How simple a thing can split our unity right in half. That's why we go immediately to a brother and say, this bothers me. I don't like what you've done. And it's because we have that relationship of discipleship that we can go to each other and say, look, I think you failed in this area. And I have failed in that area. And God has led me to success and I want to help you not shame you or gloat over your failures. When we look at the other letters that Paul has written to churches, we see an incredible concern for their spiritual stability. Paul told the Thessalonian church, stand firm in the Lord. James has said that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Peter pleads, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm firm in it. Jude tells the believers that God wants them to stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. We know that spiritual instability leads to doubt, to disappointment, to discouragement, and to a powerless witness. Instability will cause us to be crushed under trials and temptations. We will fail to hear or obey the Holy Spirit when our minds are full of the noise of doubt. That's why the Philippians are exhorted to stand firm. We know that he doesn't mean for them to stand firm alone. He started way back in chapter 2 talking about standing firm together, strive together. He knows the wisdom of Solomon declared in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12. It says, two are better than one because they have good wages for their labor. They have good results when they work together. 
If either of them falls, the other will be able to lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not a second to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who's alone, two can stand against him. And a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Discipleship is two working together. Even better, the cord of three that's not easily broken. When we have that relationship of discipleship, that's the exhortation that Paul is making in this verse. It opens with the transition word, therefore, which is our clue that Paul is going to build upon what he's already said. That's why I tried to do the review before diving into this verse. Paul has been directing the believer's attention to the life of Christ. He's been urging them to continue to pursue Christ-likeness. He's the perfect example of one who stood firm in the presence of Satan and temptation and persecution. Paul doesn't leave the exhortation on its own, but surrounds it with gracious, loving words that express his heart as a pastor. My brothers loved and longed for my joy and my crown. He makes sure to affirm once again his love for them, his deep care and concern for their spiritual welfare before he exhorts them. That's what the relationship is all about. This is an expression from the heart of Paul, not some manipulative words of flattery. The Greek word for loved is the adjective form of agape, That's the deepest, richest, most meaningful word for unconditional love. This is what we look for in those who lead us. We want those who genuinely desire our best. They're leading out of love the way Jesus leads. They're not looking for simple compliance, but they're giving direction that guides our hearts It guides our growth and it spurs us to good works. More so than any kind of dynamic personality or gifted orators, we look for those who will lead us with genuine love for us. For the flock that God has entrusted to their care. As you can tell, this is leading to a message about leaders and leadership, which we will not have time to get into today. I've been amazed by the way that God has directed both his word and my studies and the timing of our discussion in our monthly elder meetings to coincide. Next time that we're together, I will begin a series about church leadership and church polity. How exciting that is. Because it fits so well right here with what Paul has been talking about and how he has been guiding the believers in Philippi. Let's pray together. Loving Father, what a joy Paul found in guiding believers in their spiritual walk. What encouraging words he wrote to the dear saints at Philippi, whom he considered his joy and his crown. I pray that I may live my life for Christ and stand fast in him so that I will be used by you to witness in word and in deed to all with whom I come in contact. It's in Jesus' name that I ask these things and pray. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. 
We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.